Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Today's episode is a much anticipated follow up to last September's discussion on breaking the glass ceiling, where we dove into the experiences of women in municipal leadership roles. Today, we continue that important conversation by welcoming a panel of distinguished guests from across Ontario. Chatham Kent Councillor Allison Story, Ingersoll Deputy Mayor Lindsay Wilson, Woodstock Councillor Kate Leatherbarrow, Sault Ste. Marie Councillor Angela Caputo, and Kenora Councillor Kelsey Van Bellingham. Now in Canada, the landscape of political leadership is evolving, with an increasing number of women assuming roles at the municipal, provincial, and national levels of government. However, Despite this progress, women remain underrepresented in elected positions on municipal councils, and the number of mayors still falls behind their male counterparts. Now, our discussion today highlights the importance of striving for gender parity in municipal politics, achieving a balance where women hold at least 50% of elected positions not only reflects the diversity of our communities, but also ensures that local governments are truly representative and responsive to the needs of all of its citizens. So join us as we explore the challenges, the triumphs, and the ongoing efforts to promote diversity and inclusion in our local governments. There's still much more work to be done, and together we can pave a way for a more equitable and inclusive future in municipal politics. This is Municipal Affairs. Councillors and Deputy Mayor, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this great conversation about breaking the glass ceiling and getting women in municipal politics. Before I start my line of questions and open this up to the roundtable discussion, I want to go around the table and get everyone to introduce themselves so that way people who are listening to this via audio can uh, understand who you are. So uh, first off, can we start with uh, Deputy Mayor Wilson? Thanks so much, Chris. It's great to see everyone. I'm Lindsay Wilson from the town of Ingersoll, where I am the deputy mayor. Kelsey? Hi, I'm Councillor Kelsey Van Bellingham. I am a councillor in the city of Kenora, the most western part of the province of Ontario. Angela. Hi, I'm Angela Caputo, uh, the councillor for Ward 3 in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. And Kate? Good afternoon, Municipal Buds. My name is Kate Leatherbarrow, and I am a councillor in the city of Woodstock. And Allison. Greetings, everyone. I'm Allison Story. I'm a councillor for Ward 6 in the deep southwest of Ontario in the municipality of Chatham-Kent. Thank you, everyone, for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, as I said in our introduction, pre-recorded, uh, this is a follow-up to our first uh, Breaking the Glass Ceiling that was aired in September of 2023, and it was highly uh, successful. So we want to continue this conversation about women in the municipal realm. And I want to start this, this conversation off with sort of a simple but I, uh, opening question. And I want to start with the Deputy Mayor, if possible, Lindsay. Um, what brought you to municipal politics as a female candidate? I mean, first and foremost, I mean, it started with personal experience, not feeling like me and my family were represented in the decisions that were being made. And for a long time, I think I hoped that somebody else would step up. But at a certain point, you know, it's easy to say, well, somebody else should. You know, but at a certain point, if you want something done, you really have to reflect on if you're going to be the one to do it. So I was hoping to fill that role for people who maybe felt like me, that they would like to see more women at the table in our community. For a long, long time, there was one of seven, which is not reflective of our community. Uh, never mind any other diversity beyond that. So I would say I, I didn't feel reflected. And so, I, you know, other people probably felt the same, and I, I stepped up to to move that forward. Who around the table has had has sort of story is similar to Lindsay's there? Is everyone on the same page that <laughs> it was just a reflection of what was going on in council? Who wants to take that? Uh, I can. Um, I absolutely feel that way. I think uh, it became even more apparent to me when uh, I realized that only one woman uh, under the age of 40 had ever sat on our council um so and then i became a mom and um 
being a mom to a young child, especially, uh, it, it is a challenge to take something like this on, right? Like being a mom is already, I want to say full-time job, but it's so much more than that. It's a 24 uh, seven uh, endeavor. So, you know, it, it does really take a village. And I would have to say that I've been quite lucky in the city of Sault Ste. Marie uh, to have the support of so much staff. Um, and when I first came in, um, the, the ladies on the fourth floor, our clerk's department, they would often say, um, just bring Leo to the meeting and they would take her. She would just be there, but then she would be gone, um, being strolled around by someone. And I don't think they ever really recognized what kind of an impact that had on me and, and, and how they laid the foundation for women after me to now be able to uh, see themselves reflected in me and, and think that they can take a seat like I have. I just That's wanted it. to add on, um, I think to the age piece and like the stage of life too. That's incredible. I got a little like teary there for a second to be able to have that support in your uh, community to do this because it takes so much. And there's so many um, decisions that I see, I think, a not being reflected but especially around like the stage of life piece like we have a lot of time left to invest in our community and so our lens and our perspective on what we want the vision and the uh the future of our community to be if that's not being represented at the table it's a huge huge miss too so i think that there's that piece of it too that's really incredible angela i love that for you thanks yeah Leo's a little city hall celebrity. She's uh, very well known here. Um, so for those who are listening to this and watching this, I've had the pleasure to sit down with each and every single one of these municipal leaders on the cross-border interviews. The links to each and every single one of their interviews will be in the show notes below. I highly recommend you check them out because they all bring a wealth of experience to their roles. The question I have, and this is kind of, I'm going to sort of poke the bear to literally get the ball going here. When running for municipal office, trying to break that glass ceiling to get more people in municipal office, when you were door knocking, did you hear, oh, you're a woman, I'm not going to vote for you because you're going to potentially have children and you're going to be away for nine months? We are seeing out here in Calgary, a counselor just went through and uh, she had a child and good for her. Counselor Maine, uh, congratulations on your beautiful new boy. But when you were out door knocking, did the fact that you were a woman come up at the doorstep? Do you want to take that, Allison? Sure. Uh, well, the short answer is yes. Yes, <laughs> it did. Uh, quite regularly. Um, <clears throat> and I've campaigned and volunteered in other campaigns. So I have a bit of a general idea of what for male and female candidates, what they get asked. And I got asked, um, <clears throat> it wasn't as much as I got asked about being a woman and if I could handle the job or what have you, but I got asked about if I was married and if I had kids. Mm -hmm. And I, I am one of the two. I am married, but I don't have kids. And then it was things like, oh, what's your experience? You know, relevant to like skill sets I might have for the job, not to say that that isn't an important role because I to Angela's point absolutely we want more young moms middle-aged moms we want folks from all backgrounds right because that informs decisions that help make better outcomes but yeah I got asked that all the time it was first worry was I married I mean I often this was in 2022 we're not talking that long ago this for this campaign but when I door knocked with male candidates that was never that almost if it came up at all, it was literally at the end when they're just sort of, you know, having a, a quick, more informal chat. But it was definitely something that came up all the time when I I did run for mayor in the 2018 election. And the first comment I got on my newly unveiled Facebook page was, well, I will never vote for a woman for mayor. I mean, that was literally the first comment on mm -hmm. my social media. And I did get that a lot because I was running against six men was the only female running against six fairly older men than I was. And that came up all the time. But I mean, it was something that steeled my resolve instead of discouraged me, obviously. So it was something that definitely came up for me, no question. Kate, what about yourself? Yeah, that definitely. Uh, thanks for sharing, Allison. That came up for me. I ran in both 2018 and then uh, ran again in 2022 and was elected. So 
in 2018, I had three kids. And in 2022, I had four kids. So if I'm not a politician, I'm having kids. So the uh, all seriousness was I was asked a lot, will you have time for this? Um, in between the two election cycles, there was a vacant seat, which I've spoken to you before, uh, Chris. And I had one counselor at the time call uh, because I was technically the run runner up that procedurally would be appointed to this vacant seat. And I had one call from a sitting member that essentially said, well, you know, it's a lot of time. It'll affect your marriage. It'll affect your family. And uh, I do think about that comment a lot. I'm, I'm sure it wasn't intentionally to insult me. However, I was insulted. Um, but it uh, it sits with me because if there's one great trait about me is that I'm really good at time management and I get my work done. And additionally to that, when I was campaigning, a few times I'd have people ask me uh, how old I was, which I don't know how that's relevant to the job. Um, <clears throat> I'm 33, so a 90s baby, as well as some, this one gentleman was like, oh, you must be with the Girl Guides. No. Oh, you must be a teacher or, or part of a daycare. And I was like, you're digging a hole the more you inquire of what my day-to-day -day job is. So uh, to, to answer that, I have experienced it a lot. Um, but fortunately, since being elected, I don't think anybody questions what I can and cannot do now uh, based on uh, how I show up for council. So, yeah. Why do you think women are judged more harshly than men? As a group of five women who've all been elected in their own right to their own respective councillors, you probably have been judged for being a woman, being someone who is young, being an uh, because you are determined, you are persistent, that you have probably heard all the the sorest words thrown at you about why you are running. But why do you believe in 2024 women are still judged more harshly than men when it comes to getting into the elected realm? Angela, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the saying for me that always sticks is uh, women are supposed to raise children like they don't work and they're supposed to work like they don't have children. And I think whether you have children or not, it applies to women. Women are supposed to be everything to everybody. It starts so uh, young because your mom was everything to you. And so everyone who has had a mom who is everything to them now expects women to be everything to everybody. Um, but at that same time, we're supposed to be everything, but we're supposed to cap it, right? You're supposed to be everything within the household, um, but at a decision-making level outside of the home, that's where you start to get questioned. But the funny thing for me, when you asked the question about the door knocking was I actually had uh, one person come to the door and he was like, hang on, hang on. My wife's going to want to meet you. And he was like, honey, Angela Caputo's at the door. And she came to the door and she was like, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're running. And he said, um, you have my vote because she told me that you have my vote. And my, my wife makes the decisions in this house. And so sometimes I think we're seeing a shift also where that is happening and that was part of my platform when I was door knocking it was like how many decisions have you made within this house that did not include a woman under 40 and men were like none and I'm like yes so now why are we doing this for an entire city so um yeah if anybody else wants to jump in there. I would just add that uh, a lot of the time, I think too, obviously it's a societal per perception, but I think like the job's not done, you know, like we have to continue to push the needle. Obviously that's why we're all here to hold the door open for other um, equity deserving groups, et cetera. But my mom's 67 and she's a retired veterinarian. And when she was in university, she was one of the only female veterinarians in class, you know, 67, like, there's moments that we get to celebrate, such as International Women's Day, but then there's also that reminder of like the job's not done. Um, and I know in 100 years from now, whether it is the next generation or the next generation, uh, we'll look back and, and people won't be insinuating or inquiring about what we do with our spare time, how we juggle everything, like it just will not be relevant. And, and I think that that's uh, definitely a driver for me. How do we, dis how do we challenge that pers perspective that uh women are only supposed to be 
good in the house. They're only supposed to be the things that we rely on in the house. Because I've talked to male municipal leaders. I've talked to female municipal leaders across this country. And the time and time again, when I talk to the female uh, municipal leaders, the thing I often hear is people won't approach me because they think I'm just a woman. So I'm not going to be able to help them with their problems, but you have all helped your communities in many different ways. How do we challenge the narrative that women are just not supposed to be involved in politics? I think, I mean, each of us being at the table is, is a huge step because a lot of the time, you know, people only know what they've been able to see. So if all they've seen are, you know, white men over 60, then that's kind of your frame of reference. But as soon as you start to see, um, you know, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with, with that person being at the table, but the diversity of opinion, and not just the diversity of opinion, but for me, it's like just a diverse um, approach to the job. Like I know I do this job much differently than maybe someone who was on council previous to me. And I won't make any like direct comparisons or anything, but the, the, the lens I bring, the communication tools I use um, are giving an example of how the job can be done differently to the benefit of the residents. And the more, more people see an alternative way of doing the job that benefits them more, the more that kind of raises the bar and that's the expectation for the people that come behind me or who sit with me that, well, you know, I could get this. Why don't I have that with everybody? And so I think the more we show different ways of doing the job um, and women doing it successfully, people will start to, to have that expectation, which, you know, they may or may not not have at this point, I believe. Allison, raising the bar is one thing. And uh, uh, the, Lindsay just mentioned something that I want to sort of play in a sandbox for a little bit, if you don't mind. But Allison, how do we raise the bar when and I, I don't want to say this negatively, but social media is a cesspool when it comes to female elected leaders. And to raise the bar, we have to first figure out what the issue is. And it doesn't seem like anyone wants to identify that women have the right to be at council. Their place is in the council table. The place is in the legislature. To quote Madam Premier, of uh, they, their place is in the legislature, the House of Commons, their place is everywhere a man should be. But it seems like the average person just, not the average person, the cesspool that is social media just doesn't want to accept that women should be at the table. Well, I mean, it's just, it's a point of view that I do think is potentially dying out a bit it's just not dying out anywhere fast enough um and as counselors some i know there's can be differences of opinion um and i've talked to our integrity commissioner just to get you know the legit opinion on it but we don't have to put up with that and you actually can block people on social media you can restrict access to yourself because we are covered under the workplace health and safety legislation I was talking to our integrity commissioner about it just this morning because I am being attacked by someone on a project, which is totally out of line. So, but social media is a different kettle of fish. And I think, I don't necessarily think it created this monster, it just amplified it. These people didn't just show up overnight and become misogynists, but they now have a new platform to, uh, you know, share their misogyny, fire hose it all over the rest of us. But I think what we need to do and why what this group here and we have a you know we have a wide support network of amazing women in elected office across ontario and and beyond and yet if you are comfortable doing so this is also a comfort level too not everyone is at the same comfort level but to speak out to stand up for each other and to call it out when you can because sunlight is the best disinfectant and i think that is the approach for any public issue, really. But this one, I don't think everyone always realizes the extent of it. Um, often, it's not about our feelings being hurt, like, oh, boo-hoo, you know, you're mean. No, it's about often very damaging, very threatening behavior that in real life would result in criminal charges in many cases. But somehow when it's in the online realm, it doesn't matter. And that's not the case. So we need to keep calling it out, raising awareness about it. And from an individual perspective, 
we don't have to put up with it. We can set boundaries about respectful interaction with your elected officials. And if you don't meet those, then you're not going to be able to communicate with us. So it's something that, again, is an ongoing issue. And I know a lot of counselors, and again, this is totally what everyone's comfortable with on an individual level, don't do social media at all or started and got so harassed online that they have stopped. You know, I came, I've been at that point a few times. I've managed to sort of weed out, like my block list is pretty long now, but actually the last few months have been relatively, once I've gotten rid of the idiots, the rest is pretty good. So I use social media myself quite often, but not everyone's comfortable doing so and that's up to their individual circumstance. But it is an issue that gone unchecked, it shouldn't be up to us as individuals or even up to us sort of demanding legislation. I'm wearing my Bill 5 shirt, but it shouldn't be up to the, I want to say victims. I only mean that in the context of the recipients of this abuse. It shouldn't be up to us, us to have to resolve it. This is protected. We are protected in, under legislation. And why are we the ones that have to keep raising the alarm bell? So it shouldn't be up to us to have to do all the work to fix it. This is something that we need more people, especially the legislators at the province and the feds to a certain extent to to come back and, and help us because it's not, shouldn't be up to individuals to fight these battles on their own. Now, when I was thinking about this episode and trying to figure out who I would have on the show, the people sitting around here came to mind because I understand and I'm kind of, I'm not sure if I'm blowing a secret here, but I'm going to just talk about it for a second. But you guys are all very close. You all represent different parts of the province of Ontario, yeah. but you guys are called the municipal, municipal buds or municipals or however. Municipal you want buds. The municipal buds. <laughs> municipal buds. Very good. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, I want to start with Kelsey on this. How important is it for a group of elected officials? And I say not just women, because I, I think this is a fine line that we want to walk here, that women have the resources. They do have the group like you do have, but men do need their support as well. But uh, that's saying the man in the group, and I apologize for those who are about to send me nasty emails. Please send them to me, not the counselors on the table. But Kelsey, how important is it to find a group of counselors, women, like yourself to bounce ideas off of and say, you know what, I'm having a challenge with one of my residents today. How have you dealt with this uh, in your community? Well, like I can't even begin to quantify how important this group and there's like, and the, the whole group has been. And um, like, obviously a huge shout out, especially to like counselor Lindsay Koch, who I sit across from in chambers and get to make eye contact with when some tomfoolery is happening within those chambers that it's so there's like the pieces that are you know just being like okay am I crazy and being able to have those people who have gone through and be like no no like this is this is unacceptable but then I've also full-on taken adapted ideas when um Lindsay was the uh, deputy mayor Wilson was talking about like raising the bar these women are raising the bar like I don't even think that people fully understand how much work is being done by I mean the five people I'm seeing here and the the, the municipals across the province to really move things forward and I have been so grateful for that as someone who like this was my first time getting into it and and so being able to have this wealth of knowledge is just, it's, it's yeah, unquantifiable. And I think everyone should have that because this can be a really lonely job. And I think that it's really, we all only know what we know. And so like, if you're not really in it, it can be hard to fully understand what's going on. So I highly recommend everybody have a, at least one municipal bud, but like a whole team of them is definitely, definitely warranted and needed. Kate, is, oh, Councilor yeah, Montemaro, is it I important would... to get, sorry, I'm going to ask the question and I apologize. I just want to make sure I get this question out. Is it important to challenge your your fellow counselors as well? Because supporting them is great, but saying, hey, 
uh, Deputy Mayor Wilson, uh, Councillor Caputo, Councillor Story, you were out of line there. I read your comments there. What were you thinking? I just want to make sure that I, uh, if someone asked me about it, I can uh, back you up or try to figure out where you were coming from. Is it just a support group or is it a, an exchange of ideas that you have all come to agree upon saying, you know what, it's a safe space and we're all just going to have an open discussion about what's going on municipally in Ontario? Um, I think you said my name, Chris. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, I, I apologize. I, Council of the other barrel. Yeah, yeah. In terms of um, this group and the faces that I'm seeing, I would say it's 100% a safe space. You know, I will volley a question, how it shook down for me, any feedback, you know, how do I or one of us approach a really tough conversation with someone? You know, maybe somebody recommends a phone call, maybe somebody recommends avoidable at all costs. Maybe somebody recommends sitting down across face to face or have uh, an extra set of eyes there. But I personally find this space so safe and, and helpful um, as well as just furthering the needles and sharing notes. I mean, if we were all on a group project right now, we'd be getting A pluses because we're all pulling our own weight um, as well as really trying to gain knowledge as to like, well, how did that work out for you, Ange? How did that work out for you, Lindsay? Um, and, and compiling those notes. And then once you see it come to flourishing at your own table is pretty incredible. Um, and I just wanted to add a note about the municipal buds. You know, I have met women that ran um, in 2018 or prior, and they've often referenced that they wish they had this support when they first got into it. And you know, I am a firm believer in you put in what you get out and timing is everything. So having lost in 2018 and, and then winning in 2022 and looking back, I'm like, it is all about timing because I wouldn't have all of these faces. And I only hope that those that have gone without this support have have found ways to find it now, but also that we're setting people up um, going forward with success because there was one counselor that said, you know, her whole term was through Zoom. She didn't even know she could call her colleagues, kind of pick their brain. And and I truthfully don't lose sight of that because I can't imagine um, that for myself personally, as well as not having these relationships. And uh, Deputy Mayor Wilson lives like 15 minutes from me. So maybe it's the Lindsay's, but I also wouldn't <laughs> we love be here. Like you should see our chats. It's like all day, every day, you know, and uh, it really is critical to my well-being um in this job yeah I love that it's not an echo chamber though like you asked about um do we support each other would we tell one another we support each other 100 percent. but if if one of these women were going to do something that I didn't think was going to be beneficial to them or to their community I would 100 percent talk to them about it and feel comfortable talking to them about it. And we have brought ideas forward. Like Kate was very um, strong on the strong mayor powers. And her and I had discussions about, you know, I wanted to know more. I didn't know as much as she did. And, you know, in the beginning, I, I didn't know how I felt about it. And so I was happy to have her there sort of educating me on her perspective. But it is definitely not an echo chamber. Um, and and I think that that's really important. Um, I just want to give a small shout out to uh, uh, Marit Stiles, actually, for uh, encouraging me to meet up with these women. Uh, Marit had taken some time um, when I was first elected to have a phone call with me. Um, <clears throat> and she was under the impression that I had staff. She was like, are you, why don't you just lean on your staff? And I was like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> we don't have staff. Right. So she's like, Angela, you're doing all this like social media, um, all, all the things yourself. And I was like, yes, a hundred percent. And she said, you should really reach out and lean on some of these women, um, who are also first time counselors throughout the province. And she mentioned uh, Lindsay and she mentioned Kate because we followed one another and had sort of like pumped each other up like virtually. Um, and so shout out to Marit Stiles, who really is um, kind of the originator of how the municipal buds all kind of got together. <laughs> So, um, so for those who are listening outside of Ontario, Mart Styles <laughs> is just to make is, sure. 
She's the leader of the NDP, the official opposition here in Ontario. So to to feel it from that level, um, that level of uh, caliber of politician, uh, to sort of rain down to like just little old me and Sue St. Marie, a, a municipal councillor, to take that kind of time, it was really special. And uh, and I'm forever grateful to her for for uh, sort of forcing me to become friends with with other people who are going through the same experience we probably yeah. would have forced you anyways even if <laughs> that hadn't happened I also feel like it's a little bit it's like a marriage it's like we all have shared values right at the core of it but we're gonna have different approaches we all have very different personalities and, and so you're not always going to agree on things, but you have that sort of shared love and like values that you can always come back to, to sort of like simplify it, I think. Um, I, I want to jump over to Deputy Mayor Wilson for a second. And I got to ask this question. I want everyone to answer this if this, if, if, if possible. I'm going to start with Deputy Mayor Wilson. Prior to getting involved in this group, and I say this group as the Minnesota Buds, and I, I got to know, is it lonely at the top for a woman politician in 2022, 2023, 2024, when you don't have the support that you all so see, like graciously seem to have from across the province? Prior to getting involved with these great, fantastic municipal leaders, was it lonely to sort of make those decisions and try to do this by yourself? For me, no, because I always had Kate. Before we met these other people, it was Kate and I. Um, and when Kate uh, ran and, and lost in 2018, as she's mentioned before, we made the commitment to bring Municipal Campaign School to our community. You know, and four long years later, we did that. So we were always on this journey together in some shape or form. Um, and so... We, we always had that understanding of, of, I mean, what it's like to run and lose, first of all, because that stings. It's a very different experience than running and winning. Allison could say that too. And that's scary to try to run again when you know what it feels like to lose. Um, but I never felt lonely. Like, I, I always had Kate who, who we shared some of that experience. But I will say too, I, I was really lucky to have a lot of support from a lot of the people in my life already, men in particular, my dad, my uncles, my husband, um, and certainly friends. But honestly, I would say I, I'm very lucky. Um, I never really felt like I was on this journey alone. And I'm very grateful because I probably wouldn't have got this far, to be honest. Uh, Without I, I'm just going to interject for a second here because your father reached out to me the moment your episode <laughs> aired and said, thank you for having her on. She did yeah. fantastic. And I will yeah. listen to whatever show she comes on afterwards. So hi, Lindsay's dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Counselor story. I want to pick the, throw it over to you. Uh, that transition period for female politicians or female prospective politicians who run, who lose, and then decide to run again can be quite lonely. Prior to meeting these, this group, did you have a support system that you could rely on? Yeah, I mean, it's, I would totally, I would second everything that we've, that has been shared so far. Um, when I ran the first time, it was extremely lonely because it was, I didn't have this group at all. Um, and it was, I, it just wasn't even on social media, it wasn't the same vibe. Like it's what the, the big change for me with, the, with running this term was that, and I will give a shout out to Polly now, um, the, the organization founded by Amanda Kingsley Malo, who is just a rock star. And I think a lot of us started following her because she provides and her organization provides incredible resources. Most are free or for very low cost. And I think a lot of us started following her and then through her social media, found each other and started following each other while we were running. So we weren't even elected yet. And I already had, uh, we weren't all communicating regularly or anything, but certainly online and social media, I was watching all these rock star women with amazing social media campaigns that was, were inspiring my own and topics they were talking about and how they presented themselves. And I'm like, this is amazing. So it almost seemed inevitable 
that if or when any of us were successful, we would continue that communication. But I have to give a shout out to Amanda, because for me personally, that I think she was sort of the gateway to everybody else. Because yeah, in 2018, it was very lonely. And I was experienced, I experienced an extreme level of harassment throughout that campaign, like from May 1st to October 23rd daily. And I didn't have anyone else to speak to about it in the context of my community because there was still an attitude of, well, this is what you signed up for. You know, no, no one signs up for death threats. No one signs up for abuse and misogyny. We can sign up for constructive criticism and respectful debate, but the rest, no one signs up for that and no one deserves it. So I would have loved to have that, even though I lost, um, I would have loved to have had that then, but you know, the circumstances just didn't allow for it. I did in my personal life, absolutely. You know, my family was hugely supportive um, and friends. I had an amazing team of people running, like helping me run because the mayoral role is a quite a bit different than counselor in terms of a campaign for me and Chatham Kent being a massive geographical area. But the issue I find too, and we haven't mentioned it and I don't want to get too off topic necessarily, but when you are ab abused in this way so publicly, your family feels it. Like I genuinely thought I would never run again because my husband and parents, they were so deeply disturbed by what I was exposed to in my mayoral run that I thought I can't put them through it again. Like it wasn't even just about me. It was so upsetting to them that I genuinely thought I couldn't do it for them because I could not put them through it. And it's that is a tough, tough place to be in because the support system that you have don't forget also sees that and as i not from since i'm not a parent but you i know like parents no matter how old they are if they see their children being harassed and treated like that that never like that is you know that goes deep so yeah. you have yeah. to realize that your support system is affected by that as well and they may not be able to always support you in the way you might want or even need because they are deeply affected too. So that's something that we don't always talk about. There is a ripple effect when you see this happening and it's something that affects us the most being the candidate or the counselor or the deputy mayor or the mayor, but it it's not just us. It's everyone around us who cares about us too. Yeah. And we're sort of trained not to read the comments, right? Like, don't read the comments. Don't, yeah. Uh, Isn't that like little... telling a child not to touch the hot stove? You're always going to want to touch the hot stove. <laughs> but I can do that, right? So so when, when someone says to me, like, maybe a staff member might say, like, top, you know, comments are pretty hot. Maybe just stay away. And so I can make that decision. But my mom doesn't. My mom sees every single one. And then there are, like, here in Sault Ste. Marie, there's um, a group where, I'm not even going to give it light, but they sort of take things, put it into that group, and then everyone jumps on it. It's just not very nice. And I'm not a member of that group, but I have family members who are, you know, to be able to see it. And then they're like, I saw this most terrible thing about you. And I continue to try and tell them, don't read the comments, but it's different you know, for some the people that we love, I think, to to be seeing these things about us. Um, and recently, like it was pink shirt day the other day, and I made a post saying like, the politician might not see how you're or hear how you're speaking about them, the celebrity might not hear, but your kids hear, your daughter heard how you talked about me. I want you to know that. And, and that it has a huge effect. So sitting behind your keyboard, and like making mean comments about Angela Caputo or, 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 you know, Kelsey or whoever, you might think is cool cool but your kid's watching I can guarantee you that and she sees how you're treating other women not cool I'm always a firm believer of like what people say about me behind my back is none of my business I think that's like a little RuPaul for everyone and so it's funny the thing that people say they're like oh I don't know how you do it you know people come at you guys and like no one reaches out to me directly so what do I care what you have to say about me behind my back like you don't have the balls enough to, or not the uterus enough you don't have enough ovaries in your body because that's a way stronger muscle number one 
to say it to my face, even send me a direct message or an email. Like what, what do I care? But I definitely, I think see, like my mom has gotten into the comments before and, and I'm, and it's like, it breaks my heart. Cause she's like the kind and they don't sign up for any of this. And, and there's been days where I've come home and my, you know, it's been a really tough meeting and I've cried after meetings or been upset. And Ben takes a lot of that on as well. Um, but I think that like, I just want to like going back to never, I've never actually felt lonely in this. We, when we were running for this, so myself, counselor Koch, and there was another candidate, Logan Heaney, who was um, a woman under or under 40. We're all sort of like mid thirties. And so there was like a, we, we didn't really know each other prior to running. Lindsay and I sort of knew each other peripherally, but there was like, okay, we can run against each other and take that, like, try and get that, you know, young woman vote. But we all made the conscious decision that, like, that's not how this works. There's not just one of us. We all are very different people. And it was funny, there's even people who didn't realize that they could vote for all three of us at the table. And so, and then, um, Holly now and and that community always being able to see the online of like, oh, I can be doing this more. So I don't know if it's just like women are because of, you know, going back to the structure of patriarchy or whatever, but we are we are better, I think, at forming community, um, maybe than than men. And so I hope that changes, obviously, because I don't think it's a healthy way to live outside of community. And I think that's why you see such strong, like how we're showing up in our community is also so different, maybe because of that experience that we're bringing. But um, I think everyone should remember what someone says about me behind my back is none of my business. Kate, what about yourself? Uh, I can imagine family life and political life take a toll on someone, no matter how strong you may be, the dealing with the negativity, dealing with the challenges that come with an elected position must wear and tear on not only yourself, your husband, your kids, because you, when you go to the grocery store and you're with your children or you're with your husband, you're probably going to get stopped and people may be saying things about you on social media. While it's great that, uh, like Councillor Bellingham said, uh, what you say behind my back doesn't matter, but... Sometimes it does, doesn't it? Well, I just want to go back to Allison, and uh, we're all aware of Allison's journey through this, and it really upsets me, quite honestly, to see Allison go through this. Um, it's been substantially different than what I've experienced, and it just disappoints me, which is an understatement, but it does. It disappoints me to another level for all of the things that we're talking about, um, and I care deeply about Allison and her passion for her community, um, so that in itself, I think, needs a moment to realize that it's it's awful, and I hope uh, there's a brighter road ahead. Um, you know, I'm sensitive in some really in some really deep ways, um, but I would say number one, I don't feel lonely in this job, uh, whether it was in 2018 or 2022, uh, with these campaigning schools. Another one I uh, utilized was not only the one that Lindsay and I worked towards municipal campaign school, but also elect her now, which is out of Gray Bruce County, uh, Laura Wood. I've been part of their panelist as well as, you know, we don't want to recreate the wheel. We just want people and more quality and more women. Um, so I am also obsessed with this podcast. So I'm putting out lures left, right, and center after every <laughs> podcast I listen to sliding in people's DMs. But in all ser seriousness, um, I'm a business owner, a small business owner uh, in Woodstock, and I personally learned a lot through the pandemic. Um, I actually, we just had an incident at our coffee shop, one of them, two weeks ago, where someone came in and just pulled some nonsense with our staff. And, you know, I literally drove from my home to that cafe like a bat out of hell, because I've got these firm boundaries where... Obviously, in my business, it is my business. It is a safe space and all of those things. But I just don't put up with it. I don't put up with it. My mother would tell you I'm quick on my feet. Um, so, but there's ways that it is heavy. And I, I'm not lonely, but it's lonely in the middle of the night when I'm thinking about how hard this job is. Unfortunately, amongst my peers and amongst the pace that is municipal politics and amongst what we all campaign for. and why are we doing strategic plans and we're not seeing those strategic plans be fulfilled? So it's it's multi-pronged 
Um, so there are definitely moments that my husband uh, gets an earful and I'm so thankful I can lean on him as well as my mom, my friends, Lindsay on the regular and the buds. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just want to make sure that those that are listening here as a friend of Allison, that it's not acceptable. And I hope we all continue to push and call it out. I've said that well before being elected. When you're in private conversations and you're uncomfortable, lean into that, right? Don't go broadcasting. I stood up to somebody today, yada, yada. Yes, that needs to change online. But in real time, call out bad behavior because it will benefit you and it'll help somebody out, help somebody out uh, tenfold. So we talk about the glass ceiling being broken by getting more people, more women elected in municipal politics. That that crack started in Ontario in the 1920s when a female was elected mayor, very first female elected mayor and municipal leader in the province and in the Confederation of Canada. Now, you five around this table have continued to smash that glass ceiling for the next generation, for the generation after that. Now, we've talked about some very hard-hitting things over the last 45 minutes, almost an hour, and I can imagine that you want to set up your community, your generation after you for more success that you might not be able to achieve this term, next term, or however long you stay in municipal politics. What are you doing? And I'm asking this each and every single one of you, and I'm going to start going around the table in the reverse order that I started with. So I'm going to start with Councilor Story. Um, what are you doing to continue to break that glass to ensure that the next generation of female leaders who are stepping up, who are 18 and looking for their next municipal idol to say, I want to be just like Councilor X, Deputy Mayor X, Mayor X. What are you doing to smash that ceiling today? Well, I mean, there's lots we can do. And uh, thank you, Kate, for those kind words, first of all. Um, but what I'm trying to do personally is just spread the word, you know, um, the, the the ladder is is down. Like when you climb up that ladder and you're bumping against the ceiling, you don't pull the ladder up behind you. You leave it there and help and you put a hand out and pull folks up that ladder with you. Um, so for me, a lot of it is communication, like through my social media, letting folks know what's involved day to day with the municipal role. Um, but you can certainly and what I'm doing, too, is I, I, I love these opportunities to speak to wider audiences and be part of these these discussion groups, because I think it's going a long way to raise awareness about who we are. Hi. And uh, th what we're doing and showing that, you know, Women of all ages and backgrounds can be very successful in these roles, and you're and you won't be alone. Like I think it's in it's to our previous topic. If you put your name forward, like I want to be a support to women in my community who want to run, and I've tried to say that anywhere I can, even if you're running against me in Ward Six, if I decide to run next term, good. Like I want more women to run. I want more people of color to run. I want more folks from vulnerable communities that have never sat at our council table ever, ever. I want them to feel comfortable or at least have the tools to make the decision. You know, we want people to feel comfortable and well-informed in getting into this and anything I can do, whether it's a coffee or a meeting or a confidential conversation, uh, just raising awareness that I am a, a welcoming and, you know, confidential ear to anyone who's thinking about it, because that is so helpful. And then ideally, I'll be around as a support once they're elected, too. So it's something that we all can take different roles, whatever your skill set is, or whether your comfort level is, but I am, I want to help continue up, because the problem with the glass ceiling is it, it leaves you cut up, you know, like that glass ceiling leads you cut up and that glass ceiling is has a lot of cracks in it, but we're not through it, not even close. And so if I can help boost, you know, more diverse communities, the shards are gone, ideally, and we're boosting through a wide open, you know, window that I am, ha I'm happy to do that. And just anyone even listening to this, I can say without, without any reservation that all of us would take a phone call, take an email, take a DM from anyone looking to run and uh, wanting information or support or just any kind of feedback, because that's, we've all paid it forward. Like we all, 
had help getting to where we are. And that is something I know we all feel strongly about is paying that forward and ensuring that a wider variety of candidates can can run every single election. So now yeah, I, I, I I know Deputy Wilson has to jump out here in a few minutes and I said reverse order. So I'm going to throw it over to Deputy Wilson before I throw it over, back over to Councillor Leather Barrow. But Councillor Wilson, I apologize for cutting you off there, Councillor Story, for two seconds. But Deputy Mayor Wilson, um, what have you done? What are you doing to continue to smash that glass ceiling so that way the next generation can do what you do, but somewhat easier? Yeah, I mean, I think about that a lot. And um, there was a quote from Annamie Paul. She was the previous leader of the Green Party who stepped down shortly shortly after an election. And she said something along the lines of when she broke the glass ceiling, she didn't know she'd have to crawl through the shards on her way out. And I think about that all the time. Like we we do not want there to be shards laying around for these next people who come through. And so it's it's not just about asking people to run and helping them to run. It's also like, when they get there, is it going to be a miserable experience? Because we're not doing them any favors if that's the case. So I think, you know, supporting people to get there, but also leaving behind, you know, um, uh, council meetings that happen at a time that work for families or um, a procedure bylaw that considers, you know, breaking for Ramadan, like whatever it is, right? Um, because it's not easy and, and we've had a wonderful conversation but I also don't want to give the impression that this is this is um a walk in the park you know we, we all work really hard to support each other to get through these four years um and I guess the last thing I would say is helping people understand that there are many ways to get involved like running and winning is excellent and we want more people to do that but there's also a lot of work that happens in that four year window that nobody engages in, whether it's committees or campaigns or whatever it is. So if running's not for you, I still want you at the table in some shape or form. I appreciate that, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Leatherbarrow, what about yourself? What what does Councillor Leatherbarrow do on a week daily basis to smash that uh, glass ceiling that has stopped so many people, so many women, so many uh, diverse groups from jumping on and becoming part of a municipal council? Um. Well, if it's whether it's intentional or not, I certainly dig my heels in um, at any opportunity. Uh, I've said this expression before to everyone, but being told before I was elected to fill my full seat, there's people that wanted to be there that weren't there. There's people that one day will consider it, fill your full seat. Um, my hands used to really sweat before I would turn my mic on like the first six months, which was really unusual for me. So rather than dwelling on like, do, should I really make a point? I'm really nervous. My hands are sweating. Just click that mic on and say what you want to say. Um, so filling my full seat in that capacity, taking up space, you know, those, those, you know, things that I think that everyone should do outside of politics, especially women. But um, I really want to remain approachable. And what do I mean by that is I am approached from different uh, organizations or leaders in the community that just find me approachable to like shoot the breeze with or have a conversation or say about planning. Like they are reaching out to me, trying to understand how to even get involved in the public planning process. And so I find that really rewarding because as we all know, I spend a great deal of time trying to educate people, bite-sized pieces. I'm very comfortable with that. It reaffirms what I'm learning, but I'm also trying to remain approachable in hopes that that will plant seeds. Uh, just to increase people's confidence, um, as well as hopefully leading them to join me in this ring or pass the baton off. Um, so those things I try to focus on, filling my full seat, remaining approachable, um, as well as Lindsay and I are really committed to doing municipal campaign school 2.0 again. I mean, there's times that we think, holy Hannah, you know, we got to get on it this year rather than waiting till 2025 because we had a shorter runway last election. Um, but that is again a shared commitment uh, that I that I hold on to because that's just something that I feel good and and I know I'm I'm meant to do. So that would be yeah. Councillor Caputo. So um, 
I use the F word with my full chest and that F word is feminist. I am a feminist. And I will say that with my whole chest, no matter where I am. And I think it is important to allow women and to allow little girls and boys to see that happen and to recognize that is not a bad F word. It's a good word. I am an intersectional feminist. I believe, so when I'm fighting for the things that are important for to me, it includes men. It includes people of color. Um, intersectional feminism is for everyone. Like down with the patriarchy, my friends, let's, let's go. So I try my best. I try my best to um, really make that clear. I'm a feminist and I make no bones about that. Um, the best way that I think that I make things better for the next generation is uh, how I get to raise my daughter every day. And the woman that I am making her, um, she is fearless right now. She is uh, totally and unapologetically herself. And uh, though sometimes that is like painful to me, you know, 10 minutes to put your shoes on, like, girl, can like, let's go. But also I'm like, look at her go two years old, putting on her own socks, putting on her own shoes. Um, I let her choose her own clothes. It was Halloween the other day. She had pumpk a pumpkin sweater on, but like, you know what? Bless up. That's how you want to dress. I'm so proud of you. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that in getting to raise her in that way, she is also uh, able to encourage other young girls and uh, young kids around her. And I, I hope that I get to be the house that they all run to. And I hope that I get to like spread that further into her like group of friends and people. But this is me guys. And totally, um, I am who I am for everyone and I, I'm unapologetic about it. And I think that uh, we all sort of wear that badge and I like to wear it really proudly. Um, and that for me is the best way to um, influence the next generation. But I'm proud to be sitting here with um, so many other women who are the badass F word as well. So I'll pass it on. Uh, final word on this question to Councillor Be Van Bellingham. Um, so I'm all of this, obviously. And also I like, I'm a, a young uh, parent to two young kids too. And that was like a big impetus for me running was like, I want them to be in this community and like have opportunity and see how great it is and all that stuff. But like uh, on a day to day. So, I mean, we, as counselors, we govern in policy. So we have changed our, um, meeting hours to 5 p.m. for council to make it more accessible because three of us are under 40 on this uh, term of council. And then something I'm in the works of is also rewriting like our council remuneration policy because we all know that while no one is doing this for the money, it is not like ethical, frankly, in my opinion, to ask people to do this job for... At, just, full disclosure city council or for city of Kenora, I make $20,000 a year. Um, and I promise you, you are getting more than $20,000 worth of work out of me personally. Like I am showing up and like giving you way more than that. And it's not that I'm saying that this is like a six figure role feasibly at our level, but it's not fair. And then that is why it's not equitable. It's not fair. It's not just. And then that is why this role was set up for people who are retired, but people who are retired can't be the only people at the table making the decisions for the whole community. So yeah, that was another thing is, that I'm working on is making sure, and I don't know if it's gonna, like where we're gonna go with it because there's things that I find in this role that I I don't, I personally, like I worked in finance. I don't think it's ethical. Some of the decisions we, financial decisions we make and the things that we do to save taxpayer money money when you think of the long-term ramifications of not investing in having expert level people at this table making good informed decisions 
you are setting yourself up as a community for a lot of risk. And I think we've seen that in a lot of places. There is even in Manitoba here recently, they tried to fire a counselor because she couldn't make any of the meetings. And then the integrity commission said, no, like you guys have to change the meeting time so that she can attend the meetings. Like it's, it's ridiculous how we have this set up. So there's, we have to remember we govern in policy and I'm, I'm always conscious of, I don't need my voice at the table necessarily. It doesn't need to be me, but I want to make sure that there is the ability for someone who doesn't maybe have the privilege that I do to be able to do this for $20,000 a year to be able to show up and do this job because I am so aware of the immense privilege I have to do this. And it's not fair for me to have to have all those things to even get in the door and still have a really difficult time sometimes um, doing it. So it's important to me that we try and change that for people who shouldn't have to deal with some of the nonsense that happens at that table. I have one last question before I let you guys go, because we're at the hour mark. Before I ask this question, I'm going to say that Deputy Mayor Wilson did have to jump off. I did say that beforehand, but she has jumped off. So it's just the the four amazing counselors left uh, here. So I want to ask advice, because you are now all role models in your own respect, in your own individual communities. When young female students, high school students, your children look at you, they are seeing someone that they can sort of emulate when they get older. What advice would you have for that next generation? Because we talked about breaking the glass ceiling, but we now want to ask, what advice would you want them to have so that way they don't have to go through what you have all gone through or are going through right now. And I'm going to reverse this again, and we're going to start with Councillor Van Bellingham. Uh, what advice would you give to a young female potential candidate or councillor candidate who wants to potentially be you in two years? Don't wait for someone to ask you to do it. And don't you dare wait until you think you have every single box checked off to apply for something because that is not how people get into any position in the world you need to be here now and the qual fyi the qualifications in the city of kenora you have to be 18 years old you have to be a resident of kenora period period that is all that it takes so you need to you need to be here everyone's voice matters and that's the way that you create a community that works as if everyone is at the table making that community work um, just a side note on that in BC, the entire province, you only have to be 18 years of old age. You don't have to run. You don't have to live in the community. You can be in Prince George and run for Vancouver. That's the great thing about municipalities in different provinces. They all have different <laughs> rules. So please check the, the rules out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is for Ontario. <laughs> Councillor Caputo, uh, what advice would you give to a potential candidate, a female candidate who was thinking about breaking the glass ceiling with you? Um, I would say, uh, use my shoulders and, and please stand on them. That is like the one, uh, thing that I hope I get to leave behind. I, I am totally standing on the backs of, uh, so many women who came before me. And I hope that I get to act as a step for women that will come after me. Um, but further than that, I, I hope that they recognize that they are enough and not to change the way um they come into this job i had said uh when i started this that i wanted to change politics and i didn't want to let politics change me and so far i'm feeling really good about that um and i think that uh my voice at the table has made made differences and i have had little girls you know talk to me about See, you know, I saw you in the paper. I saw you on social media. I'll be sitting at my restaurant and little girls are like, oh my God, there she is. I know her. I know her. And it is like, it could make me cry. Right. Um, and so you are enough and we need you and use your voice and never back down. Just keep going. Councillor Arthur Barrow. I would say uh, get out of your own way. Um, at the beginning of this conversation, 
I was going to share a point and I didn't, but I was never asked to run. I didn't see myself at the table. I went through the delegation process. I stood before council and I said, huh, I think I can do this. Um, and I think when I say get out of your own way, um, in that off chance that uh, a sitting member was like, oh, it's a lot of work. It'll affect your marriage. It'll affect your family. Had I listened to that, maybe I wouldn't have ran in 2022. Um, there's no better time than the present. Don't let anyone kind of give you all of the negatives or perhaps what's hard for them. Don't put that onto yourself. Um, I know it's cliche to believe, to say, believe in yourself and trust me on the hardest days. I'm like, listen, Kate, but stay out of your own way, go for it. And there's no better time than the present. We really need to start believing in ourselves. Um, so that would be my, my advice. And final word to counselor's story. What advice would you give to a potential candidate, female candidate, diverse candidate who's thinking about putting their name on the ballot? Yeah, I love I love what everyone has already said. I can barely add to it. I would actually I'm actually gonna like take those to heart for myself because I'm always getting great advice from these amazing women. I would say a few things just to sort of add a few of my two cents, but don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, to Kelsey's point. Women are, we're our own worst critics a lot of the time and we hold ourselves to impossible standards and you don't need to. You can, to Kate's point, get out of your own way. Be unapologetically you, as Angela said earlier, do not make yourself small for anyone and just be kind to yourself. And last but not least, I would say, uh, ask for help. You know, if you have questions about almost anything about running, whether it's political or policy based or about family life or partners, what have you, I, I've never been turned down when I've asked for help from someone, whether it's this wonderful group or anyone else for that matter. People do want to help. So if don't, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. There are no stupid questions because there is, I mean, a lot of people have done great work, including Kate and Lindsay, to help essentially write a handbook for women running for office, but there's no like official, you know, book you go to in the library that says this X, Y, and Z, this is how you're successful. No. So we all had to sort of figure it out ourselves and anything that we've had to figure out, we want to share. We want to share to help you be successful. So always ask for help. You'll get it. You'll get those answers returned to you in kind, but just be unapologetically you and don't make yourself small because if you're listening to this podcast, especially, you're friggin' amazing. So already right there, you've got yourself ahead of the game. So thanks for this opportunity to to share our thoughts today, Chris. You've been an, a huge advocate for municipal politics. I can't believe how much I've learned from all of your interviews. So thank you for taking the time to do this with all of us. Thanks. First off, much appreciated. This isn't about me. This is about you and all of you breaking the glass ceiling. But I want to take a moment and say thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, I, 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 as a Calgary podcaster who's focused on municipalities, I never thought I'd be talking to so many amazing people from my home province of Ontario. You have all honored me so much to sit down with me individually, but now as a group to talk about life in municipal politics and breaking the glass ceiling. Any way that I can be an advocate to get more women involved, I am so here for it, and I will make sure that I do my best to get more women on this show. I, I truly mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for stepping up and serving your communities. Um, at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, while not a sponsor of the show, does have amazing resources on FCM. Highly recommend you look them up. There will be links in the show notes. AMO, which is the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, also has amazing resources. And the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association, ROMA. Uh, we're sitting down with Robin Jones, the president of that, later on this month as well. Um, there are amazing organizations that the councillors and deputy mayor have talked about over the last hour. Please reach out to them if you are thinking about running. As Councillor Leather Barrow said, no better time than now. Do it and break that glass ceiling together. Councillors, thank you so much for taking time. Everybody's schedule to do this.
Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance and the decisions government make in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well engaged on issues that are important to municipalities from coast to coast to coast. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few months. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.